gentlemen. Besides a distinguished guest speaker for this inaugural session, Honorable Minister for External Affairs, we will have a president of the dais, we shall be having Honorable President of the ICCR, Dr. Vanessa Srubudde, respected Dir Director General of the ICCR, Sri Kumar Tuhin, and respected Madam Vice Chancellor of GNU, Professor Shanti Sri Dhulupudi Pandit. Indian Council for Cultural Relations, the cultural arm of the Ministry of External Affairs, was founded 72 years ago for establishing closer relations between India and her neighbors in the East and the West. With this objective, the Council has forged ahead with a single-minded determination and unwavering commitment to participate in nation building by strengthening what is inherently ours and building bridges by sharing them with the world. In doing so, it has evolved over the decade and become a channel for soft diplomacy, which is inexorably tied to the ancient Indian philosophy of Vasudheva Kutumbakam, or the world as one family. In order to translate India's popular global goodwill into more vibrant diplomatic relationships, the ICCR has been undertaking a plethora of new initiatives under the stellar leadership of Honorable President of ICCR by expanding its cultural outreach and diversifying its activities to actualize the concept of New India, where cultural footprints are being enhanced to complement diplomatic ties. The India that perceives culture as a unifying force and believes in the confluence of civilizations. We are gathered here today to be a part of yet another first of its kind new initiative of the Council, promising new beginnings of promoting the idea of New India. As, idea, as India is celebrating the 75th year of its glorious independence and its rich composite culture, and is holding the G20 and SCO presidency this year, its presence is being increasingly realized and solicited in the international community. The time could not therefore have been more right than now to hold interactive sessions with eminent scholars for a broader and richer appreciation of India's foreign policy as a leading power. The country's rising economy, its influence in shaping the global agenda, and its role as a first responder to global humanitarian crisis have all transformed how the world views India's international relations. ICCR is organizing this national convention on India's international relations in association with India's premier central university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, with the idea of developing a well-informed and nuanced understanding and dissemination of the singular vision and achievements of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi in the arena of international relations since 2014 and the road that lies ahead. As Honorable Minister, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar puts it, there has been a transformation of three Cs in India's international relations, capabilities, credibility, and context. The plenary sessions would focus on India's G20 presidency, India's foreign policy, India's economic relations, strategic partnerships, expanding defense ties, and India's soft power, among others. Each session would be led by eminent speakers and would be followed by discussion among the participants. Before we proceed with the inaugural session, may I request the dignitaries to kindly come up for the ceremonial lighting of the lamp.
May I now kindly invite Madam VC JNU to extend a floral welcome to our distinguished guest speaker who would be presiding over the inaugural session, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jay Shankar. I know. I now kindly call upon Honorable President of the ICCR, Dr. Vanessa Srabuthe, to deliver his welcome address. He's a researcher, come student of political science, a trainer in democracy by profession, and an author and editor by passion. Respected uh, Minister for External Affairs, Dr. S. Jayashankarji, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shanti Shri Panditji, the DG ICCR, Shri Kumar Tuhinji, members of the academia, various heads of departments of international relations and allied subjects coming from over 40 universities, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you and especially to Dr. Shri S. Jayashankar for having kindly consented to be here and to deliver a keynote address. While I welcome you, friends, I must also share with you that there are at least four important factors that dominated our thought process when we decided to organize this convention. Firstly, the fact that India is fast becoming a nation that the global community is looking forward to. India's foreign policy, too, is being watched and analyzed globally. Never before in the past, India's take on a particular global issue mattered so very significantly. Diplomats today ensure that Indians do not misunderstand their country or their country's particular policy approach. While hosting the headquarters of International Solar Alliance and now a global platform for disaster management, India has become the voice of the developing world and in certain areas also the global south. On environmental issues as well, India is seen as leading from the front. All this requires that India's foreign policy is rightly understood first by the academia, the members of the academic community, and later by the people at large. The second factor that weighed heavily on our minds was the growing importance of international relations. In a globalized world, even the day-to-day -day lives of common citizens are impacted when there is some crisis in some part of the world. International relations, therefore, is no more only an academic discipline. Changing world has taught us that IR literacy, international relations literacy, has become a must and hence continued engagement with academics in IR, we believe, becomes very critical. I am happy to share with you that when I had discussed this with Dr. Jay Shankar, he immediately identified himself as a student of international relations and accepted our request to deliver a keynote address in this convention. Let me express once again our deep sense of gratitude towards Dr. S. Jai Shankar for his kind consent. Thirdly, friends, we at the Indian Council for Cultural Relations are conscious of the fact that culture is fast acquiring centrality in many global issues. From conflicts between different nations to perception deficit faced by some countries and from attracting foreign direct investment to making a significant mark on global world of celluloid, the centrality of culture, cultural understanding, and in that sense of soft power is difficult to deny. Besides academicians, journalists and media persons too play a key role in promotion of soft power. 
whether it is the translation of major literary works in globally important foreign languages or removing wrong references to India in several school textbooks abroad, the role of academics just cannot be undermined. Fourthly, this convention aims at engagement and dialogue with academia. The design of this convention is a testimony of this objective. Dialogues and conversations between policymakers, policy researchers, policy teachers, and also those who implement these policies always add huge substance to the ongoing public policy discourse. This convention, I believe, would facilitate this dialogue both formally and informally. It is in this backdrop that we at the ICCR thought it fit to take lead and organize this first of its kind national convention on India's international relations with Jawaharlal Nehru University as our knowledge partner. This is a unique initiative and I have an earnest appeal to all of you that through quality participation coming from all, let's make this a uniquely successful convention as well. I'm happy Dr. Jay Shankar, even though he maintains a very hectic schedule, was able to take out some time for all of us. And uh, once again, I extend a very hearty welcome to him. I thank uh, our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shanti Shri Pandit, and all her uh, colleagues in the JNU for having extended cooperation to the ICCR. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. An esteemed alumnus of this premier university, JNU, our knowledge partner, with masters in political science and an MPhil and PhD in international relations, is our honorable external affairs minister, Dr. S. Jayashankar. He served several diplomatic assignments before holding office of the foreign secretary from 2015 to 2018. He is synonymous with India's new global image that has now undergone a metamorphosis and has been reshaped with national interest at its core, but harmonized with the global good. Under the exemplary vision of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, projecting a sound and efficient force, driving the country's diplomatic initiatives. Lending it a new perspective and framework, Dr. Jayashankar says it's purposeful, pragmatic, and proactive. It's a shaper, not an abstainer, a stabilizer rather than a disruptor, a net security provider, and a dispenser of global good. We have the distinct privilege to hear it from the man himself, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. S. Jayashankar, with his inaugural and keynote address. May I kindly call upon you, sir? President ICCR, Dr. Vinesh Astrabuddhiji, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Santishri Panditji, Director General ICCR, Ambassador Kumar Tohinji, dear colleagues, distinguished representatives from the academic world, uh, let me say what a great pleasure it is to join you all at the National Convention on India's International Relations, which is being organized by ICCR and the JNU. Now, I stand before you uh, not just as the External Affairs Minister of India, but as uh, a product of your knowledge partner, uh, and also uh, as someone who has two degrees in international relations and one in political science. And not least, uh, I also managed somewhere in between to produce a book, uh, which if I may say so myself, is not doing so badly. Now, I thought this is really an opportunity to share uh, my experiences, my perspectives, as a practitioner uh, of international relations with a very strong interest uh, in its knowledge base, in its analysis, uh, with those who, who actually have that responsibility. And uh, so uh, what I would like to do really is, is to put forward to you some thoughts uh, on this subject. Uh, and uh, uh, I would, of course, uh, very much look forward to hearing 
your questions, thoughts, suggestions. The first point which I would really make is that when we look at India's international relations, it's vital that we constantly uh, keep in mind its changing context. Its changing context in terms of the goals, the ambitions, the tactics, the strategy that India has. The fact that today we are at an inflection point, uh, having uh, now completed 75 years of independence and looking 25 years ahead probably for the first time actually thinking of an era rather than a term of office, of actually uh, absorbing, understanding and absorbing what the changes in our own society means for foreign policy. Because at the end of the day, how a country defines its interests, projects its interests, will naturally depend on, on the state of society, on the debates within the polity, uh, on the identity, on the, uh, on the uh, thought processes of that uh, society. So uh, the, the fact that there has been also a sea change in India uh, is something of very direct relevance to the uh, study of international relations as well. And then there is, of course, the state of the world. The state of the world has also undergone a dramatic change uh, in this period. Uh, perhaps uh, the most uh, sweeping phenomenon ha has been that of globalization. Uh, and it has had its uh, successes and opportunities. It has had its iniquities and uh, failings and vulnerabilities. But what globalization has done uh, today in terms of creating forces that have rebalanced the international order is something that any study of anybody uh, evaluating international relations has necessarily to take into account. And over a period of time, what started off initially as largely economic process and then acquired political and greater connotations, today has uh, obviously created the basis for an emerging multipolarity which would probably be the characteristic uh, of the world order uh, in, the, in the coming decades. Now, if those are the broad trends, I think in recent years, uh, the, the international system has also witnessed significant shocks. Uh, it's not just the international system, but certainly it has had an impact uh, on world politics as well. And uh, to my mind, uh, the COVID would be the most serious and significant of these. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not just a health pandemic. It is not even uh, a, a once in a century experience. It has actually had very deep uh, consequences, many of whom actually we are still only beginning to realize. The second shock, uh, which is still an ongoing one, is the conflict which is taking place in Ukraine. Uh, the consequences of that, and here, uh, what globalization has demonstrated is that a conflict in Ukraine has touched every country, every society, just as the COVID touched every country and every society. But closer to home, we have seen some other changes, very consequential changes. Uh, the, uh, the pullout of the US uh, and Western forces from Afghanistan is a very, very uh, important uh, development. Uh, we also are seeing uh, the, the sharper competition uh, between major powers, especially between the United States and, and China. And uh, these two have, have uh, their impact on not only the system, but individual players as well. So the, the point I would make is that when we look at international relations, when we uh, debate what should be the optimal approach for India. We have to take into account both the changes within India and the changes in the world. And keeping both these as very significant variables, try and work out what is really uh, today uh, the, the right issues and the right priorities uh, for our foreign policy. Now, while I have 
largely described what you could call political or politico-economic trends. There is one uh, aspect of this change, which to my mind is truly revolutionary, where the study and practice of international relations is concerned. And that is really the power of technology, the impact of technology. Because technology combined with, with globalization today has made, has created very serious challenges uh, to, to concepts of sovereignty. Uh, that uh, they uh, have, uh, what they have done at one level uh, is to encourage, you know, very, uh, a new trend of very powerful forces uh, who may not be national, uh, but who, who try to play the entire global field. At the same time, uh, they raise issues, issues about the digital domain, about data security, about data privacy, uh, how all of this could be reflected in, in uh, new uh, capabilities uh, like artificial int intelligence. So uh, international relations in that sense today has to very much take into account uh, also the uh, very deep impact of uh, technology on our lifestyles and consequence, consequently on the relationship between states. Now, how has the Indian system responded to all of this in the last decade? I would suggest for your consideration, in one way, especially since 2014, uh, we, have, uh, we have tried to uh, organize foreign policy, organize our own assessments and study of the world in a, in a, in a kind of a different mandala which, which to our view is more relevant, which is more practical, uh, which is much more organized in a way, much more uh, amenable to implementation on the ground. So if you hear a lot of these concepts, which undoubtedly you would have, say neighborhood first, or you would say act east, or we say, okay, link west or sagar. Think to yourself, schematically, the kind of uh, processes, the analytical processes that we have uh, in our mind, uh, which is really an India with a set of neighbors uh, whose, whose proximity uh, and whose history uh, has today uh, made them absolutely essential to further our rise. And we need to have a non-reciprocal, generous, far-seeing policy vis-a-vis -vis these countries. Uh, and how do we promote connectivity, cooperation, contacts with our immediate neighbors? That is really, in essence, what Neighborhood First is about. A second circle, in a way you could say, is if you go in each of, our, each of the directions out of India, you have uh, uh, we had earlier uh, look east, uh, but the look east was felt to lack certain components and not have a, a kind of an uh, executional mode uh, that was required, especially when it came to physical connectivity, when it came to matters like security. So upgrading eastwards to act east, and then reaching out to the Gulf through a, through a Gulf policy of linking west, and then for the first time, really looking at all our maritime neighbors as part of Sagar, uh, that you have a, a, a unified, uh, I would say, approach towards uh, multiple maritime neighbors. And finally, a reach out to Central Asia. So you have really in four directions uh, the concept of, of extended uh, neighborhood. Now, Naturally, in this world, uh, with, with competition among countries, especially among uh, big powers, uh, it's important for us uh, to look for uh, optimal positioning, for optimal set of relationships. So our effort has been, uh, again, to engage uh, all, the all the major powers or major groupings, uh, and do so in a manner in which you know, our choices and our options uh, are not constrained by one particular set of relationship. 
No, obviously this is not equal. I mean, it is not, it is neither our calculation nor the outcome that we would have the same uh, sense of closeness or the distance with each of the major powers. It would depend on, you know, where we have been able to find intersections of interest uh, and how they have promoted, how they have responded uh, to our needs and requirements. But the, again, the point is that uh, we have been able, in a sense, to do multiple alignments. The depending on the issue, depending on the theater, depending on the country or the set of uh, countries there, we have been able to strike very different combinations, which have each uh, actually advanced uh, our interests. Now, uh, uh, moving beyond that, uh, I, I think even in the uh, what uh, Dr. Sastrabuddhi mentioned. We have, as, a, as uh, the first uh, of the decolonized countries, uh, we have a very strong emotional solidarity with the South. You know, uh, the, and this is not, you know, this is not a, a, just a throwaway statement or even a, a slogan. You know, it is something actually very deep, and when we deal with many regions, you can feel it. Uh, they also have that sense of attachment uh, to us. And there have been occasions where, in a practical way, we have been able to demonstrate uh, that uh, southern solidarity uh, with the global south. So, and most of all, uh, that uh, centers around Africa. So, in the last uh, uh, nine years, what we have actually seen is that the bulk of the new Indian embassies are all opening up in Africa. Uh, that our development partnerships have grown in Africa. Today, there's virtually uh, no African country which doesn't have some kind of Indian project or some kind of partnership uh, program uh, with us. But, uh, and I'll come to this a little bit later, uh, but given the G20 presidency, uh, we felt that this solidarity that we had with the South should also be uh, captured as an exercise of of what we call the Voice of Global South, where we consulted uh, close to 125 countries about what their real needs and requirements were, which most of them believed today the G20 uh, was not giving enough attention to. So this is the kind of schematic sense uh, of the world that I would like you to consider. And uh, ending uh, that point on one particular note, that today, as an economy of three and a half trillion dollars, the fifth largest in the world, uh, one who's, which is rapidly globalizing, it is also time for us not just to do address the immediate and medium term challenges, but to think, as I said, for an era ahead, the Amrit Kaal. So our effort is also simultaneously to actually plan for a global footprint. So. If you see regions today which may be geographically distant from us, where we may not have had uh, contemporary uh, relationships and experiences, they have today very much come into focus as well. So the Indian foreign policy in that sense is actually operating at multiple levels, at multiple time frames, uh, with a much, you know, I would say a layered uh, agenda in mind thinking for today, tomorrow, next decade, but also a quarter century ahead. And I can say this with a great deal of certainty that I certainly am absolutely convinced that in Amrit Kal, India will become not just a leading power, but India will uh, at, at the, you know, the trajectory that we are in, subtle is very likely to become a global one as well. Now, if I can move on a little bit to how we, deal with the world and how the world perceives us. If I were to sum it up in a single sentence, I would say the big change uh, probably in the last uh, decade to two decades has been that we are today seen not just as a taker, but as a giver. That our contributions, our sense of responsibilities, our stepping up at the right moment uh, for the most difficult challenges. This is today both the basis for a greater, more intensive interaction with the world, but also 
the foundation of how the world today sees India very, very uh, differently. And I'd just like to give you uh, some examples uh, of how uh, our actions that, that as I said, uh, that we are today a giver as more than we are a taker. Uh, perhaps the most graphic one, the most impactful one I would give uh, is that of vaccine maitri. You know, I cannot tell you as, you know, as the, not just as the foreign minister, but as someone who travels around, meets people from different countries, what a profound impact that has made uh, in the world. That there are countries in faraway regions who, who say this very openly, that, you know, that they did not get the vaccines from actually stockpiles which were much closer to them. Uh, and that it took an exceptional country to, to do that even as we were vaccinating our own people. A second example I would give you is in regard to climate action and climate justice. That we have in the last eight years actually demonstrated that India is deadly serious about climate action, that we have the determination and the capability and the program and the governance quality to bring about huge changes uh, when it comes to addressing this set of challenges. But while we do all of this, uh, we are also very much a champion of climate justice, that there are larger uh, principles and goals and interests involved there, uh, as I said, uh, much of that of the Global South. Uh, and this is something that we are very clearly perceived to be uh, a strong voice. A third is the question of terrorism, counter-terrorism to be more precise. It's an issue where uh, India has uh, a singular, I would say, credential to speak about. Because no country has suffered in the last, since the Second World War. Uh, uh, in respect of terrorism as much as we have. And we have suffered so much because for a, much of this period, the global agenda really did not take this to be a global issue. You know, it was either seen as something, you know, internal, something bilateral, uh, something which was episodic. It was, you know, it, it was a friction which got out of hand to bring this issue fair, square, and center into the global agenda, and then catalyze other processes. To, you know, uh, today, uh, ca countering terrorism has many, many manifestations. You know, it extends from uh, the uh, cyber world to the financial world, to actually, uh, uh, to training which countries do between themselves, uh, to diplomatic delegitimization of, of uh, terrorism. So uh, that too is a, is a uh, subject on which we have been able to bring about a very significant change. And then, of course, uh, you have all noted that we have gradually, steadily, but today I think with a great deal of success, built up our profile as a first responder. A first responder in what are called HADR, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Situations. Uh, there were times when it would be our immediate neighbor. We saw that with Nepal, we saw that with Sri Lanka and Maldives, with uh, Myanmar. But increasingly, with others in need as well, you know, our forces went, our uh, NDRF went recently to Turkey. Uh, some time ago, a few years ago, uh, our uh, forces went to Mozambique. Uh, we have been during, uh, in Operation Rahat, uh, we were the country which went into Yemen. And we have done this not just for, for ourselves. Uh, we have always, again, demonstrated uh, that principle of the world is a family uh, by also helping other, others uh, of different nationalities in distress. And I think that has had a very, very uh, sort of positive impact on the the you know, that image of India today as a caring global player. Now, there are uh, three other uh, aspects which I would like to mention. Again, two of them Dr. Sahasrabuddhi uh, covered. One, India is today a creator of new institutions. That too is a change. You know, 
we may think of ISA or CDRI as you know actions we have taken in respect of uh, climate change or climate you know but step away from the domain the very idea that India takes the initiative and actually gets a hundred different countries to join an international organization devoted to a particular subject that itself is a very is a, is a is a I would say a graduation in the international order uh, the second is actually championing causes and practices. Uh, the most successful of these, of course, is the International Day of Yoga. Uh, you know, what was something which many of us did naturally, but individually or socially, today has actually become a global movement. It is something with which the rest of the world connects with Indian culture and where there is a perception that Indian culture has contributed to a big difference in global lifestyle. A second, which is ongoing, is what we are currently trying to do in respect of millets, uh, that by, uh, uh, by very vigorously advocating an international year of millets, uh, how do we actually propagate uh, uh, a grain uh, which is more nutritious, which uses less water, which is grown by poorer farmers, which is part of our collective traditions. A large part of Asia and Africa and Latin America actually ate millets for many, many years, but which has been overwhelmed by you know, later developments. So when we speak today about you know, rebalancing, uh, it's not only economic rebalancing, political rebalancing. There are, you know, rebalancing is only serious when there is a cultural rebalancing, when there is a lifestyle rebalancing, when heritage and history and practices are shared and uh, appreciated on a more equal basis. And that is something we have been able to do, uh, I think, uh, definitely in the last decade. I know there is a long way to go there. And finally, in this segment, I would uh, point out to you that especially in the last decade, we have demonstrated the willingness and capability of looking after our people abroad as much as we've done at home. The idea that a country will, you know, bring back seven million of its citizens during COVID, that when our people are in distress, as they were during uh, the Ukraine conflict or when uh, Taliban took over Afghanistan, or as I said, when the Yemen civil war was taking place, this, this, because to be taken as a power seriously in the world, I think the first test is to be able to take care of your people. And that is a test, and it's a, it will be a recurring test because we have a growing diaspora. Today we have a diaspora, I mean, if you take NRIs and PIOs uh, of about 33, 34 million, and this figure will only grow with the passage of time. So how do we build that into our foreign policy? How do we make this? Because there are a lot of tricky issues involved here. There are issues of other countries' sensitivities and sovereignty and, you know, so, uh, and we have very, very deftly managed that. So uh, I, I uh, do believe uh, that uh, in many ways, the image of India, uh, the sense of India has changed. So, what are today the contemporary issues that we need to address? Uh, I would say there are a new set of challenges which certainly uh, IR study in India needs to look at. And they may not always, they often may be interdisciplinary challenges. And if I were to look, for example, what would be my six or seven priorities? Because I think in some way or the other, they would impinge on your, uh, your analysis and what you think are today the key factors in international relations. For us today, how do we actually uh, rebuild, re-architecture the world economically through supply chains, through more reliable and resilient supply chains? Secondly, how do we deal with the digital era? You know, how do we ensure that there is, uh, you know, the practice of trust and transparent partners uh, what what then become the key relationships? So so what you would have is our political partners, our economic partners, our energy partners, our digital partners, 
they may not be the same. There would be a high degree of overlap. But how do we actually look at these key, key uh, uh, issues which today are make or break issues for us? And how do we create those partnerships? Uh, one, of course, which I mentioned is we have to prepare for the global workplace. So, uh, you know, the diaspora should not, you know, diaspora is today truly worthy of very detailed policy consideration and academic research. Because the diaspora is very unique by nature. Every country they go to is, you know, there is a, there is a particular characteristic which develops. So how do we find the lowest common denominator? How do we cater for the specificities uh, of the diaspora? This is uh, in itself a challenge. The global commons, because we are moving to an era, we are moving to an era where Amer the application of American power will be less. Uh, there is no ready compensation from any other country. The rise of China does not necessarily mean that China will take up these responsibilities. So how do we actually address deficits uh, in the global commons? And you have already seen one example of that, which is the Quad. That Quad has come together because four countries feel that in one particular area, the Indo-Pacific, they have the comfort level of working together uh, to address uh, those issues. Uh, and then what I call the influence that India will have uh, really uh, on the world uh, by example that what we do at home, you know, I uh, often I get asked, when you go abroad, what do people ask you? People are extremely fascinated by what's happening in India. So for me, the foreign policy and the domestic change are no longer watertight compartments. I mean, they never were, but they are even less so today. That India as a demonstrator, I would say as a laboratory, a demonstrator, a scale up, uh, you know, a field uh, example. All of that is happening at the same time. So these, I feel, are some of the issues that uh, today uh, we need to uh, look at. Obviously, as a, as a country, as a, what is clearly a rising power, uh, whose, whose prospects are bright, but there's obviously a lot of effort that needs to go into it. We too have certain uh, I would say uh, uh, objectives or uh, tasks before us. And we have to be quite clear that what do we stand for today uh, in the world? And to my mind, obviously, as a, you know, we are one of the few civilizational states left in the world uh, that uh, how, do we, how do we project our culture, our heritage, our narrative, uh, I think this is something which is uh, very much today a part of international relations. Secondly, values and beliefs matter. Values and beliefs matter even more in a digital age. You know, For each one of us, where our data lies, who is looking at our data, is extremely important. So we cannot, that era when we were agnostic uh, about the nature of our partner, that for us, everybody was a Westphalian black box to be dealt with. That era, I think, is, is uh, behind us. Uh, I would say national security, you know, our sense of national security. We have, no, we have really not been taken as much of a comprehensive view of national power as many other countries have, you know. Uh, if we had, I would be seeing much more IR writing about the importance of technology. I would see, in fact, it's the people in international relations who should have been the foremost advocates of Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make in India. Because if you do not have the deep strengths at home, how are you going to battle in the international arena? So we need a much sharper awareness uh, of comprehensive uh, national power. And as I said, you know, I think uh, in this, this era before us, the next 25 years, we really need to prepare for a global footprint. That is to me as much a challenge uh, for the academic world in its analysis, in its study, in its recommendations, as it is for the practice, practicing world and for the political world. So these were some of the thoughts. I, once again, really uh, 
uh, thank ICCR uh, for, for the opportunity. I, I really think this is a very, very commendable initiative. Uh, to me, uh, a gathering of uh, you know, uh, people uh, dealing with such an important domain is something uh, which is long overdue. Uh, I would, of course, have one, one uh, wish, which is I, as you know, as I'm, some years have gone by since I've actually sat in a classroom uh, or sat on that side of the classroom. Uh, but I sincerely feel that there is a lot in our own heritage and traditions uh, that perhaps we have not drawn upon uh, sufficiently. Uh, in my own way, I've tried to provoke a bit of a debate uh, uh, in that respect. Uh, I would very much hope that uh, many of you would take that debate uh, and certainly that desire on my part uh, forward. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. And, and with that, we come to the question and answer session. Uh, this, being, uh, this being an interactive session, we have compiled a list of questions uh, from the eminent delegates here. Some have raised multiple questions, but due to the paucity of time, only select questions would be taken. Uh, with your kind permission, sir, I would like to read out these questions. I'll take them one by one. Professor Madhumati Deshpande from uh, Christ University, Bangalore, wants to know from our Honorable External Affairs Minister, can we stop being offended by what anyone says about us? She says, I'm referring to comments made by entertainers like Rihanna or other, comments by BBC documentary, comments in Singapore's parliament. Identify. Kindly identify yourself. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I can do question by question, is that okay? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Look. I don't think it's a question of being offended by what people say. I think it's a question of, uh, of uh, I would say, putting across your point of view or when you see somebody doing something which is blatantly um, unacceptable or wrong, to call it out. I mean, you are in a university. If you saw a student cheating, you wouldn't keep quiet. If you saw somebody, you know, say things about your university which are blatantly untrue, you wouldn't let it pass. I wouldn't for my country either. And I say this because often, you know, the kind of things which are said in the public forums, you, you are astonished how people get away with this. And, you know, some of the recent debates that have been in public space, you know, people saying that, you know, million Muslims will get disenfranchised in this country. Now, the fact that somebody can say this year after year and get away with it. Or when you have political hatchet jobs done by a broadcaster and then say, well, you know, I'm exercising my freedom of press. So to me, it is reputation. So I'm not the thin-skinned guy. You know, if people say, as I say, tell people, look, you have a right to have your views but then have the courtesy of listening to my views about your views. It can't be a one-sided conversation because that's how it used to be. You know, when I say rebalancing, rebalancing also means I have a voice and I have the right as much to rebut something false or something wrong uh, or something unjustified that is said about me. I'm just exercising that right. I hope that answers your question, Professor Deshpande. The next uh, question, in fact, um, Professor Anupam Sharma has asked a couple of questions from uh, Indira Gandhi Tribal University, Amar Kantak. The first question is, uh, we have cultural affinity with our neighboring countries and South, Southeast Asia countries as well. What are the potentials of India's soft power to integrate this region? The other question that so, she's asked- uh, We'll just take one, yeah, one from okay. a person. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's a very good question uh, because I, you know, as someone who's traveled in Southeast Asia, you know, when you go to uh, Cambodia, you know, Angkor Wat or Taprom, or you go to Vietnam to Mison, or you go to uh, Bali or to Borobudur in Indonesia, I mean, this, uh, we just have to see it. 
to to immediately understand the magnitude of the connect uh, to india yet when i look at our own international relationships over the last 75 years i wonder why we have not been able to translate that into a basis for st a stronger connect with this region and with individual countries i came to conclude at some point of time that maybe we didn't because we ourselves were not confident about our own culture in india and therefore we were hesitant to make culture a major connect with the world outside today i i think that era of hesitation is behind us that when we look at uh, you know many of these uh, countries and in fact that is why uh, whether it is the ministry of culture uh, minachi ji uh, uh, is the minister there or it is iccr or it is the archaeological survey of india we are today trying to use all of these as connects with other countries believe me if some other country had been in our place i i'm i'm sure they would you know they would have immediately picked up on it so we have a lot of lost time to make up for but i do believe where there are cultural connects uh, these are very strong foundations to uh, to actually bond with other people other societies uh, uh, other traditions and uh, i certainly uh, want to emphasize that we intend to do that Uh, the third question is from Dr. K. Jaya Prasad, Central University of Kerala, Kasaragod. She wants to know: uh, Is there any possibility to convert quads into a quad into a formal alliance? Uh, I would say no, and I would like to explain why it's a no. You know, three of the quad members are alliance partners, not. all three together but uh, you know with the two two of them with the us the alliance mentality and the alliance culture is something which was very much a product of the 1950s and 60s it's been refreshed over the years it involves very deep obligations very major responsibilities uh, you know uh, concessions or Uh, demands depending on which end of the transaction you are uh, of of a very uh, serious kind that is not our history it is not our culture it is not the way india's dna certainly independent india's dna uh, in my view is so if you look at the debates of the last 75 years you know one way of dealing with this was in the initial years to say i will stay away from it okay now in reality of course when when uh, uh, moments of uh, stress were there we made we made certain uh, i would say tactical adjustments perhaps more in some cases so you had you know when in 1962 november uh, when bombdila uh, fell to the uh, attacking chinese forces Uh, pandit nehru wrote that letter which many of you would be familiar with uh, seeking uh, support from america and uk he wrote that letter to president kennedy a decade later when we were presented with this uh, you know uh, pakistan china us uh, sort of triangle uh, when the bangladesh genocide was going on uh, we turned to the soviet union uh, and in my view uh, you know i i not my view i think nobody no indian doubts the uh, soundness of that judgment the but the natural position of our country is to be independent you know so when those moments of stress pass we return to to what is our natural position today i would say there are requirements in the world there are challenges in the world there is need for international cooperation certainly countries who have a particular rapport with each other uh, could do more uh, uh, there are tasks which can only be done better with shared responsibility so i see the need but what we have been able to do is to also convince the other partners that that era of alliances is actually over uh, that uh, if you want to work with a country like india you have to come up with something very flexible 
uh, something which is very collaborative, which is very uh, consensual. Uh, and that, to my view, is what, what the Quad is about. So I, you know, to, every time I get that, you know, that push or that question saying, is it an alliance? Why is it an alliance? I, I just think it's like asking, you know, a T20 player, why isn't it a test match? It's a different era, you know. And we just have time for two more questions. Uh, Professor Siddharth Malabarapu from Shiv Nadar Institution of Eminence wants to know, has there been a shift in how we perceive the global, global south in Indian foreign policy today? If there is indeed a shift, right, right. Uh, right. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Has there, been, has there been a shift in how we perceive the global south in Indian foreign policy today? If there is indeed a shift, has it been conceptual, symbolic, material, or purely pragmatic in nature? You know, uh, we have had a long, as I said in my remarks, we've long had a bonding with the global south. But this bonding often took a kind of a coming together on a political platform. You know, that, that's been, you know, if you look at Bandung or you look at other other exercises. So everybody came together, reaffirmed principles, uh, you know, spoke about the common way in which we view the world, and then we went in our different ways. I think what has changed today uh, under Prime Minister Modi is we are looking at practical manifestations of uh, that expressing that solidarity. So today, India's development partnership extends to 78 countries in the world. So if you take 100 and whatever, 195 countries. So more than one third of the members of the UN, today we have development projects in those countries. Uh, if you see, again, something as important as the vaccine demand during vaccine Maitri. So what is happening is, is, you know, it's not only how we are approaching the Global South. It is how the Global South is looking at India. For, uh, for the Global South, it is not just an India which said, okay, we are all in it together, there is solidarity, uh, good joint communique, great statement, now we carry on. It is actually today, uh, you know, examples. Global South is extremely interested in what we are doing on the digital side. You know, I cannot tell you how much the world is fascinated by the digital delivery that is going on today in India. For me, it's the number one subject of conversation abroad. And the Global South particularly, because a lot of the problems that we faced before 2014 are also the problems they face. You know, their leakage is as much as our leakage used to be. So, so I think there is an agenda, there is to some degree we are an exemplar. Uh, there, are, there are commensurate experiences which can be transposed. Uh, there is the, you know, the sharing part that, you know, if we have uh, vaccines or we have medicines which need to be distributed at a point. Uh, and there is finally this, this issue because when countries often rise up the international order, uh, they do not, all of them always remember, uh, you know, where they came from. So, I think the Global South appreciates today that we are still very much uh, a sincere and authentic voice of the Global South. That no other country, I must tell you, at the, in the G20 exercise has actually got the Global South together and said, you know, I'm prepared to spend a few days, and this was done by the Prime Minister and six of his ministers saying, I'm prepared to put aside a few days and listen to what you have to say because I will take the distillate of what you said into the G20 councils and try and put across your interests. So we have today, I think, that bonding, that sense of uh, uh, confidence with the Global South. And in my view, uh, I mean, it's certainly in, in a competitive world, it, it is always helpful to have many more friends. But as I said, for us, it is a matter of principle, it is a matter of belief. Uh, and I, I think the world sees that as well. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request uh, Director General uh, of the ICCR, Shri Kumar Tuhin, to deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, 
Uh, as we come to the end of the inaugural session of the Convention on International Relations, uh, I have the present uh, duty of giving a vote of thanks. The journey of Indian diplomacy has indeed been remarkable and a story that needs to be told both with accuracy and pride. And therefore, to begin with, I would like to convey our gratitude to Dr. S. Jayashankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister of India, for taking time out of his hectic schedule and for gracing today's event and addressing us and also taking questions from delegates, giving us a picture of this journey of Indian diplomacy, both from the broad perspective as well as the small nuances. In his remarks, he told us about the changing global landscape, the challenges that we face, what strategies would be relevant for India to make a path ahead that would serve our national priorities. I extend my sincere thanks to President ICCR, Dr. Vinay Sashpudde, who has been the driving force behind this convention. Uh, our sincere thanks to Professor Shantrishi uh, Dhulipadi Pandit, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Chancellor of JNU, for getting the JNU to be the knowledge partner of this convention. Right from the ideation stage to the final stage, JNU has been a very, very valued partner of ICCR. I also thank in advance to all our speakers, including Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs and Culture, uh, Minachi Lekhiji, who would be speaking later, and other speakers who would be speaking uh, tomorrow and again later today. In the end, my thanks to all the delegates present today, who are all distinguished faculty members and heads of International Relations Department from eminent universities of India. Thank you all for taking time out and traveling to New Delhi for this convention. Wishing you all a very good evening and very productive and stimulating discussions later today and tomorrow. I thank you. Minister of State for External Affairs, Madam Minakshi Lekhiji, is, has already joined us. She'd be presiding over the next session. I, I kindly invite Pre Honorable President of the ICCR, Dr. Vinesh Sastrabudhe, to extend a floral welcome to our distinguished speaker for the next session, Honorable Minister of State. Ms. Minakshi Lekhiji. Uh, delegates, uh, and uh, I'm really happy that Madam uh, Minakshi Lekhiji is here because she is not just a minister for external affairs, but also Minister of State for uh, Culture, which is something very close to the activities of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. I'm just sharing with you that uh, ICCR, along with a voluntary organization, Roots to Roots, organized a kind of uh, short film competition, basically for uh, NRIs and also for the alumni of Indian institutions who are abroad. And uh, it was a very structured competition, just three minutes duration was uh, allotted to them to come out with a film. And these three minute films on various themes uh, came to us in a big number from across the globe. And then a panel of judges selected a few of them and three of them we are going to screen before you. The first film that comes to you is on the theme Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, 
which is the theme of the G20 as well. And the winner of the first award is Arun Ashok, who is from Australia. The second film that comes to you is uh, from the alumni, foreign alumni who had studied in India. Her name is Olka, Olga Chemris. She is a Ukrainian, but currently she lives in Switzerland. It is on Indian culture, imprint, imprints on my mind. And the third film that is coming to you is in Hindi, prepared by an Armenian student who studied here. Her name is Alina Khigatyan, and the theme of the film is Learning in India, Learning from India. So three short films, I'm sure you would enjoy it, and I'm sure uh, ma'am uh, would uh, definitely guide us as to how do we utilize these kinds of new media to further strengthen our cultural relations with the global community. So enjoy the three short films. Breaking news with Paul Tool. We begin with breaking news. Olivia from Melbourne has broken the national record in Little Athletics Australia's multi-class discuss event. Let's watch the recent interview we had with Olivia in our multicultural program. Namaste, you're watching M4 TV and welcome to Vasudeva Kudumbagam. The world is one family. I'm Shama Shashidran and today we have with us Olivia, the national discus champion. Olivia, let me start with a big congratulations. I'm so happy for you. Tell me, how did it all happen? Well, who was your biggest motivation? The one, the only, own. It all happened on one fine morning when I visited my nearby little athletic centre. I saw a boy practising discus theory in a ring. Hi, my name is Ob. What's yours? Olivia. That's nice. Well, would you like to have some Indian food? Cooked it myself. Well, actually, with my mom's house. Really? I love to cook as well. Sometimes I feel it's all I can do. Don't be silly. Do you like discus? I don't think I'll be much use. Come on, is it okay if I push? He is really the spinning motion of your hands. How? I'll never be able to get a good spin. for support for the future. Wow, what an inspiring journey that is. Kids, now what's your future go like? Olympics and Paralympics 2032 in Brisbane. Once, in school, we got the task to draw flowers. I drew flowers that dance. Now, I feel like that flower. And I dance.
I have my roots in the beautiful land of Ukraine, in the city of Kyiv. But just like a flower cannot grow only with minerals from its roots, similarly, I was searching for the sunlight of wisdom, which I found in India and its culture. Studying Hindi, Indian literature, history and philosophy, living in India and learning Bharatanatyam changed my life completely. I even found the love of my life, my husband, in India. And when it was time for blossoming, the war began. Running away from the horrors of war, we landed in beautiful Switzerland. Life always finds its way to blossom. And like a flower spreads its fragrance, I will spread my love for Indian culture and my motherland. <laughs> ऐसा क्या है इस देश में कि हम जैसे विदेशियों को आकर्षित करके अपनी ओर खींचता है ऐसा क्या है इस देश में कि घर से दूर अपने घर का महसूस होता है नमस्ते मेरा नाम मलिना है मैं आर्मेनिया से हूँ हिंदी भाषा साहित्य एवं भारतीय संस्कृति के प्रति मेरी रुचि ने मुझे भारत तक पहुँचा दिया भारत आना एवं यहाँ सीखना मेरा सपना था एवं भारतीय सांस्कृतिक संबंध परिषद के माध्यम से मेरा सपना हकीकत में बदल गया मैं उन सौभाग्यशाली विद्यार्थियों से हूँ जिनको भारत में सीखना एवं इसके साथ साथ भारत के अद्वितीय सौंदर्य को देखने का मौका मिला भारत में सीखने एवं यहाँ रहने का प्रत्येक दिन मेरे लिए बड़े महोत्साह की तरह है यहाँ का वेशभूषा खान पान संगीत और नृत्य त्योहारों की विविधता मेरे दैनिक जीवन में खुशियाँ लाती है एवं मेरा दिन रंगों से भर जाता है भारत में सीखने के दौरान मैं भारतीय संस्कृति एवं भारतीय लोगों के सोच विचार से नज़दीक से परिचित हुई अलग अलग देशों के विद्यार्थियों के साथ भी मेरी दोस्ती बन गई है यहाँ मैंने हिंदी भाषा सीख ली एवं हिंदी साहित्य के अनमोल रचनाओं को पढ़ना एवं समझना शुरू किया हिंदी साहित्य की ऐसी रचना जैसे सूर्यकांत त्रिपथी निराला की राम की शक्ति पूजा ने अपने अनुथान ले अपनी भाषा और सुंदर्य के साथ मुझ पर घोर प्रभाव छोड़ दिया रवि हुआ अस्त ज्योति के पत्र पर लिखा आमर रह गया राम रावण का अपराजी समर आज का तीक्षण शर्वित्रित शिव प्रखर वेग प्रखर शतशैल संवरणशील नील न बगरजित स्वर प्रतिपल परिवर्तित व्यूह भेड़ कौशल समूह रक्षस विरुद्ध प्रत्यूहु क्रूर कपी विषमोह भारत में सीखने एवं यहाँ रहने के साथ साथ भारतीय ऐतिहासिक एवं सांस्कृतिक स्थलों का भ्रमण करना भी अनिवार्य है यहाँ रहते मैंने कई यात्राएं की और मेरा विचार है कि भारत के समृद्ध इतिहास और संस्कृति भारतीय समाज एवं भाषाओं की विविधता को पहचानने के लिए इसके हर एक कोने को अवश्य देखना चाहिए भारत से मैंने क्या सीखा भारत ने मुझे न केवल हिंदी भाषा एवं साहित्य का ज्ञान दिया बल्कि भारत से मैंने सकारात्मकता से सोचना एवं खुद पर विश्वास करना सीखा भारत ने मुझे आत्मनिर्भर बनाया अपने घर और परिवार से दूर होते ही हर तरह की चुनौतियों को स्वीकार करना एवं परिश्रम और धैर्य से उनको संभालना सीखा मैंने भारत ने मुझे आत्मविश्वास दिया 
और सबसे महत्वपूर्ण ये है कि भारत से मैंने खुशी से जीना एवं जीवन के हर पल से आनंद लेना सीखा धन्यवाद For this next session, we are truly honored to have with us Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Ms. Minakshi Lekhiji. Madam would be presiding over this session with her ministerial remarks on the importance of India's G20 presidency. We are also awaiting the presence of uh, Sherpa of G20, Sri Amitabh Kantaji, who will be with us very shortly. Today, as we are deliberating and discussing New India as a vibrant, pluralistic society that is striking a chord and making the world amenable to India's aspirations through its international relations, this convention would not be complete without focusing on the G20 presidency that India has assumed through an exclusive session. For India, the G20 presidency also marks the beginning of Amrit Kal, the 25 years period beginning from the 75th anniversary of its independence on 15th August 2022, leading up to the centenary of its independence towards a futuristic, prosperous, inclusive and developed society distinguished by a human-centric approach at its core. As our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji has said, let us join together to make India's G20 presidency a presidency of healing, harmony, and hope. Let us work together to shape a new paradigm of human-centric globalization. Our distinguished speaker, Madam Minakshi Lekhiji, would now be delivering her ministerial remarks on the importance of India's G20 presidency. She's the current Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs and Culture of India since July 2021. She's an honorable member of parliament from New Delhi parliamentary constituency in the 16th and 17th Lok Sabha from the Bharatiya Janata, Janata Dal Party. She's known for her work in the field of women's rights and has been associated with several organizations working for the empowerment of women. May I kindly call upon you, ma'am? Thank you very much, uh, Honorable President, Mr. Vinay Sasbuddhiji. Uh, we have DG ICCR present here. Coordinator for this particular assignment, Professor Shanti Panditji. Uh, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, honor and pleasure to be here. And uh, since we are two people speaking on G20 for this session, uh, Sherpa, I think, would uh, be behind the procedural aspect and all the elements which we are doing through um, action-oriented thing. And I would keep it to the foreign policy initiatives and G20 presidency, as we have got, the, the philosophical side of the whole uh, policy. Uh, when I was uh, sitting there uh, with you, and I was constantly looking at the G20 logo. And obviously, repeatedly, the G20 theme was coming up. And to go by what is G20, it's a very erudite uh, audience today. But I must say that uh, the sheer weight of G20, come to think of it, uh, a collection of 20-odd countries in this entire globe, which make up for 85% of world's GDP and 75% of world's trade and about 60% of population. You can imagine this group of just 20 odd nations has such a weight in running global affairs. So its presidency becomes an important marker for us and the other thing which I was listening constantly was India's positioning when we get this presidency. So I go back to the theme which all of us have heard not once but multiple times, Vasudev Kutumbakam. 
Now, obviously, the theme of this entire G20 presidency, when India gets to run the presidency, is leaving its footprints in this globe or in this association, showcasing what leadership is. And just these words, Vasudev Kutumbakam, outlines the theme of our policy, that world is one big family. And if world is one big family, is it just a world to please each other, just a pleasant thing to hear, or it's going to be converted into actions, and that's what India's presidency is going to be all about. Then we look at the, the uh, logo. Just have a look at the logo. Logo is representing three colors of our national flag. Now, obviously, the primacy is to Indian ethos value system, which are depicted through the colors of our national flag. We can see the lotus, which is, of course, showcasing that no matter how disturbed your circumstances are, no matter how much of muck is all around, you can still blossom like a flower. And that to lotus, which is the ultimate flower in our ethos, value, civilizational value system. And I just recently learned that in Libya, some 2000 BC plus some odd time, when builders from India had gone there to build some, construct some temple, now whichever religion those temples, etc., may belong to today, but the, the top, the chhat, had engraving of lotus. So most of our temples will have engraving of lotus. That is the prime symbol of Indian civilization. So civilizational values, which are not just 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 year old, but a few thousand BC is what we call our civilizational value. And whenever we talk about India's strength, it is the continuous civilizational aspect which we emphasize and Lotus is representing that aspect. And of course, in turbulent times, you can still flower, still blossom, and still carry on with pristine beauty. That's what the flower is representing. And of course, the globe. In, in this globe, in today's time and age, when we see uh, plural challenges all across, you can still find still waters and continue to blossom. Which, which Indian economy is normally represented as. When we look at G20, we look at, I was, I was sitting here and I was also listening, there was some question about global south, has the position shifted, etc. I must say while India took the presidency of G20, we looked at the challenges which the world is facing and how best we can leverage our position uh, when we are occupying the presidency of G20. The other set of thing which is coinciding with G20 presidency is the presidency, presidency of SCO also. So India also has SCO presidency. And uh, SCO presidency means the Central Asian and uh, our uh, neighbors and neighbors first policy will also be tested through SCO. Then, it is Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. We've completed 75 years, and this is the first year of Amrit Kal. Now, why is Amrit Kal relevant for all of us? I don't have to repeat much. You all know. Amrit Kal is relevant because our forefathers sacrificed their life for the independence of this nation. And why was independence important? Independence was important because G20 could not have happened to a slave nation. The presidency has come to us because we are an independent nation, an independent nation which brings a value system on the table across the globe, which probably leading by example. And leading by example, we are going, we had just been through pandemic. And uh, when pandemic happened, we saw how supply chain disruption happened, how people were struggling with food, food, food chains how people were disturbed with financial well-being, how economic disruption took place, how global economy suffered. And coming from a position of a country which is India, and 
both in terms of literal sense and uh, uh, philosophical sense, India symbolizes a bridge, a bridge between various cultures, various value systems. So when we say India is a country of the South, we are a country of the North and we are a country of the East and we are a country of the West. Uh, I will try to explain that our global positioning, whether in terms of the, I welcome Mr. Amitab Khan, who's just joined us. So, uh, the position, when we look at India's position uh, on the map, uh, we are a country of the North by virtue of being a member of G20. G20 because it's a, it's a economic cooperation we are looking at, and by being the fifth largest economy today in the world, it's worthy that India is participating uh, in G20 presidency and continues to uphold its value as the president of G20 because if global economy needs to progress, get ahead, or uh, any of these things need to happen, North represents the economic resilience and India showcases that to the globe, that how India's position in global North is relevant. Now, India is a country of the South. Why I say so? All these years, whether uh, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, India, and the entire southern nations have been used to showcase that these were the countries which were usually subverted by virtue of imperialism, were subjugated, exploited, and they have huge challenges. Now, till 2014, whatever looks today was not the picture. So we are a country of the South as well because we had these challenges, we continue to have these challenges, and we choose to become a voice of the voiceless because in global policy making, the global South does not have a position. Most of the positions are occupied by global North because these are the economies which control the policy making and trending their uh, views across. And then uh, we feel that in true to our nature, that democratic participation also means participation of the people who, for whom the policy is being made. Now, if global legal system or global trade system or global economics or global shipping or uh, commerce, are, they are going to be policy related to these subjects. Should the global south not be participating in those? Should there be no voice speaking on behalf of them? So we chose to become the voice of the vo voiceless and thus representing the global south in terms of formidable leadership, which India gets to represent while dealing with the global north. We are a country of the east because there was another question which was about Southeast Asia and Indian relations and how we can use culture. I would say we don't really have to use culture, we only have to revise our syllabus and we only have to tell the world that most of these things have gone out of India. And if we don't stake those claims, others will stake claims. And that's what is happening in the globe. So what is happening, while academics may have one point of view, which I recently came across that SEO cultural meet happened, and we had the subject Buddhism. Now tell me, Buddha was born here, Buddha got Parinirvan here, Buddha got enlightenment here, Buddha's scriptures were written here, he used Earth Magdi as the language, the Sanskrit, the Pali, the other texts, and all this root, which others have usurped as silk root. Was it a silk root? According to me, it was a, a Eurasian Asian root, trans-Eurasian root. And this trans-Eurasian root carried culture, carried trade, carried religion, carried textbooks, carried language, carried spices, also carried silk. But it suddenly gets to be usurped and named as silk root because we were slow in claiming it. We don't claim it in our universities amongst ourselves. And imagine somebody just comes and uh, takes it away. So this is called usurpation. 
Now, you're, when you're dealing with globalization, you're also dealing with usurpation, and thus calling it Eurasian trade route out of India becomes very important because India was the center. And India was the center of thought, philosophy, trade, and of course, Vishwaguru by virtue of being knowledgeable in most fields, including astrophysics, mathematics, and so on and so forth. I constantly question this. I said, when we talk about historical point of view, in that historical point of view, people will say 300, 400, 600 year old um, existence. Uh, Galileo, we all know, was killed because he said Earth is flat. A thousand plus years before that, we had calculated the distance between Earth and the Moon, Earth and the Sun, nine planets, other systems. Uh, this was what India was. So obviously, we had all the right to be called Vishwaguru because we were the hub of knowledge. We ran the first university. We sponsored scholarship. And over a period of time, that particular narrative gets destroyed and gets to be taken away by others. I think G20 is the time when we start reclaiming that narrative. And I was very happy that some of the scholars from other countries came up and they said, oh, we have these writings. This, is, this script is very similar to the script we have. And all this came from India. So while at a political level, there may be a different discourse, but the academic level, the discourse is all this has come from India, including Shaolin. So I would say G20 presidency becomes relevant for us to showcase our relationship and influence even on the global East. And we are a country of the West. Be, everyone will look at me with uh, little, you know, question marks. Now, how are we the country of the West? We are a country of the West because we have democracy, we have freedoms, we have independent thought, and we have very strong institutions. Again, like culture, here also, our marketing skills have been very poor. Our marketing skills have been very poor because I asked all of you academicians. Tell me which country has a budget exclusively assigned for minorities. Tell me which country has the way we have the minority rights. Tell me which country on the globe will talk about when the first spate of uh, Jews were thrown out of Jerusalem and other regions were given shelter. First Christians to be out who, who were thrown out were given shelter here. The first Muslims arrived here. And all this was possible because there's a, there's a particular ayat in um, Quran, which I often quote, which says that uh, you must understand that Jews of the world will get divided into 67 subsects. The Christians of the world will get divided into 70 subsects. And you, my followers, will get divided into 72 subsects. As academicians, I want you to analyze which country, Islamic Republic of XYZ, represents 70 subsects. Which Christian, Catholic country, this country, that country, which do not even recognize India, I mean, they recognize India as a political entity, but do not recognize Hinduism as a religion. Talk about secularism to us. And we are not able to communicate because we've not done enough research that which country which follows Christianity recognizes all these 70 forms of Christianity. Catholic cannot get along with Protestant, then there is Methodist, then there is Orthodox, X, Y, Z. India has them all. And yet we are blamed, we are questioned. I think time to build narrative around our values. Unfortunate part has been that we have neither understood our own values, nor have we marketed our values, and nor have we brought focus to our values. I think when India takes G20 presidency or SCO presidency, it's time we bring up papers, we study these subjects from our point of view, and we build the narratives around the challenges which our country has not just economically, but dealing with all this. And while dealing with all this, we have protected tribes, 
All these tribes were killed elsewhere. This country protected. This country's constitution protected. The tribal lands, tribal rights. We have an exclusive ministry dealing with that. We have a, every ministry, you know, like every ministry, we have a tribal welfare ministry, which is dealing with just this subject. We have a, a scheduled tribe person as president of India, and that to a woman. We've not been able to showcase our strength, all the goodness that India has. It's time to showcase it to the world and say, this is Indian value system. And when I say India is a country of the West, Supreme Court, High Courts, Human Rights, uh, Women Rights Commissions, there is a system, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, minority commission, proper budgeting, ex-Supreme Court judges, this is your structure. Tell me which country has this structure. Not one. And there's no conversation about it. I think the institutional well-being of this country also needs to be showcased. The constitution of this country needs to be showcased. And we suffer because the legal systems as they exist today, unfortunately, the legal systems cater to one point of view and not the global south's point of view. So I think even there, the building up needs to happen. And this is the right time that we start uh, emphasizing on this. I go back to the original thought, and that was about when multilateralism started. And the challenge was immediately after World War II, 1945. So World War II, 1945, multilateralism, all kinds of institutions uh, come up. and the two main purpose of those institutions was let there be no conflict, there, let there be no wars. And the second was, if at all there are conflicts, we must preempt it and we must arbitrate it and legal systems must protect it in a manner that we are able to resolve the differences. Now tell me, is this the first conflict, what we are facing, what the world is facing? Is this the first conflict since 1945 in some part of geography? Or is this the last conflict? And if it is not, then we need to reform multilateralism. Because multilateralism somewhere has failed to achieve its purpose. And it has failed because countries like India, which mean well to the world, who have a very open society and well-meaning governance system, do not have much say in running the multilateral systems. And thus, reform of the multilateralism is one subject which G20 will focus on. The second aspect would be being the voice of the voiceless because all these planning, mechanism, policies, everything happens while the global south has no say in the process and procedure. So the, the global south summit which the prime minister conducted and led from the front was representational in nature, and whether it's economic challenges, or it's uh, climate challenge, or it's food security, or it's energy security, it's uh, supply chain management, diversification, uh, economic stability, these challenges will have to be met by keeping the global south's perspective, and thus being the voice of the voiceless is the second limb of my argument. That's what G20 represents when we become the uh, voice of the voiceless. Third and the last, I would say G20 is also a time that India has many strengths. India's strength in the field of uh, environment, climate, has been our lifestyle. Our lifestyle is, uh, in pecuniary sense, we are, uh, we are all, um, uh, very thinking people, it's consumerist now, but still within consumerism, recycle, reuse, uh, these, are, these are principles on which most of the families and societies live on, and there is a downward supply chain also, where recycle, reuse is a habit and temperament. So whether it's in, International Solar Alliance, it's disaster resilience, uh, it's uh, every other uh, you know, disaster resilient uh, infrastructure. Some of these, uh, or, or mixing ethanol, energy challenges, renewable energy, these challenges India has gone through, has met, 
and is on its way to meet those challenges. And going back to the Prime Minister's motto of life, living for environment. So living for environment will be one other methodology by which we can showcase and bring a conversion of points of views where we say that lifestyle changes need to happen across the globe, shifting from consumerist culture to uh, living for environment and living for environment uh, should become essential for every everybody else, not just for India, but for everybody else, including India. So focus on life because that is our strength and Indians by temperament will be uh, very open to uh, this suggestion because we use a lot of natural fiber, recycle, reuse, reharvest. Uh, there are some policies managing the waste uh, managing things, ethanol production, uh, green energy, funding and financing for green energy. This is our core strength area. Time to showcase to the world that this is our core strength area and this is how the world needs to follow the leader. The second aspect where we have the strength today and we showcased it during pandemic is our use of technology as public goods. So use of technology as public goods is something which India showcased uh, in past eight years. I'm sure the bright minds were always brightest, always. But how that has to be used as a policy, I think last eight years showcased and put the benchmark. And the benchmark was when COVID happened. During COVID, managing the timelines of 1.2 billion Indians uh, on distribution of vaccine. Making of vaccine was one strength. Distributing the vaccine was the second strength. And everybody gets inoculated was the third strength. Using COVID as a platform to deliver those public goods was the fourth strength. And just not this when it came to giving money. There were many countries who were sitting with piles of dollars who wanted to give it to their uh, in, uh, citizens but didn't know how to do it. Whereas we have created UPI and just a single stroke, a few lakh crore just gets transferred to all the farmers every quarter. The, the digital mechanism by which uh, under Ujwala Yojana, every woman who's running a household gets 500 as part of her subsidy for the gas cylinder. Uh, postal banking system to integrating uh, all other banks uh, to uh, using JAM, Jandhan, Aadhaar and mobile. Uh, these are our strengths and these are public goods. Using digitization as a method of public goods for delivering public goods is India's strength. We showcased it in past eight years and we have reached a certain level of supremacy excellence in, in managing these systems, which the global south also needs, including global north. So you'll be happy to learn that countries like Australia and others, the banking systems are managed by Indian systems. Many others across the globe are looking at us for finding solutions, for running their cabs, for running their uh, grids, for running their systems, because digitization, the way we have done it, and making it very, very secure network is what is India's strength. So using digitization and other deep technologies for India's well-being are the basis of well-being of the globe. Importing, I mean, I was reading one article this morning which was telling that how our exports have gone down a little because the export market has constrained. Global slowdown, everybody slowed down, so global economy has slowed down. So we, there has been a constriction of the export. But you'll be happy to learn that our imports have gone down substantially, still more. So we are still, in that sense, a surplus uh, economy because our, uh, ex our imports have gone down. 108 unicorns this country has produced in eight years. 800 odd startups are working. Women-led development would mean that 80%, close to 80% of mudra loans have gone to women. 75% of loans by government have gone to uh, startup uh, India are given to women. Uh, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, the house is named to the woman householder. And I was in uh, Latin America and a couple of other countries where they were still struggling with single mothers who do not have 
homes and who do not have residences and government doesn't know how to handle this problem because everywhere you need uh, husband's name and things even to get the benefits. So I said we just tweaked one system. We stopped giving the benefits to the man of the family. We started giving it to the woman. The whole scenario changed. And the benefit has accrued to the ones who needed to be protected. So protecting the most vulnerable has been the policy. And as spoken earlier, I think when we are talking of uh, international relation, when we are talking of G20, how India is looking at all these systems to build a narrative about what is ours, can be shared with others, and our experiences have been huge and huge learning lessons, plus others have greater strength in certain fields, be it technology, biotech, pharmacy. There are always places and things, or defense, arms, manufacturing, where, which we can pick up from them, and using the multilateral banking systems to achieve the SDGs, for example, to achieve the global goods in terms of public goods is what G20 presidency of India is all about. And we go back to the prayer, which um, I'm sure all of you have heard it, Sam Gajatvam, Sam Vadadvam, Sam Vamanansi Janatam, which means let's walk together, let's speak the same language, and let's live in harmony of mind and soul. That's the principle we are following and working with everyone. With these words, thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, ma'am. We're very happy to have our next distinguished speaker join us for this session, the G20 Sherpa, Sri Amitabh Kantaji. He would be throwing valuable light on India's G20 presidency, content, and conduct. I now invite Director General ICCR to extend a floral welcome to him. The role of the Sherpa is crucial in shaping the G20's agenda and advancing the interests of their respective countries. The term Sherpa is used because, like the Sherpa guides who assist mountaineers in climbing the Himalayas, the G20 Sherpas are responsible for guiding the country leaders through the complex terrain of international economic diplomacy. Sri Amitabh Kanji, an Indian civil service officer who currently serves as the CEO of the National Institution for Transforming India, or the Niti Aayog, a government policy think tank, is a Sherpa for India at the G20. He has served in various positions in the state and central governments and is known for his contributions to India's economic development and driving several key initiatives, such as the Make in India and the Digital India campaign. May I kindly call upon you, sir? Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, who's also my member of parliament. Uh, I live in her constituency, so she's uh, very, very important for, for me, and we all vote for her in block. And uh, Mr. Vinay Shesbude, uh, the very distinguished and learned head of ICCR, uh, the dis distinguished Vice Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University, and uh, where I have studied, and I'm an alumni of Jawaharlal Nehru University, and uh, so it's very nice to be speaking while she's there. And Mr. Tuhin Kumar, the distinguished Director General of uh, the ICCR, who's assisting and supporting us in all the cultural events which we are doing in G20. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, India is. Uh, hosting the G20 at a very uh, complex and a very turbulent time, if you look across the world. It's a period of great upheaval. It's important to put it in the context that 
The post-COVID era has seen about 200 million people go below poverty line. Almost 100 million people have lost their jobs. There is a slowdown in global economy and almost one third of the world is under recession according to IMF. Almost 75 countries of the world are facing a global debt crisis. There is a challenge of climate action and climate finance. And on top of that, you've had the new financial crisis in the United States of America with the Silicon Valley Bank. And on top of all this, there's a geopolitical crisis in Europe with the war going on for almost over a year and having huge implications on food, fuel, and fertilizer. We in India view that despite all these challenges, and all these challenges are actually opportunities for India, and as the Prime Minister has said that India's presidency will be very inclusive, decisive, and action-oriented. And therefore, despite all this, we are working in G20 with great positivity, great confidence, and great uh, optimism so that India, during its presidency, is able to truly make a difference to the world. A G20 presidency is important because G20 comprises of both developed and emerging markets of the world. It accounts for almost 85% of the global GDP. It accounts for almost 78% of the global trade, 90% of the patents, and almost two-thirds of the global population. So whatever G20 decides, it has huge implication in terms of implementation because all the implementing arms of the world, that is IMF, World Bank, WTO, all are present during the G20 discussions. When India hosts the G20 through this year and when it, the leaders meet on September 9th and 10th, there'll be over 43 leaders of the world present there. 20 plus 9 invitee leaders plus all the leaders of international organizations. So ladies and gentlemen, what are India's priorities? First and foremost, let me say that at this point of time when there's a slowdown of growth, it's very important that G20 accelerates the process of inclusive very resilient and sustainable growth for the world, for the global economy. And this inclusive and resilient growth is important, as the minister said, that we have to be the voice of the voiceless. And this is important because almost one third of the world is in recession. And this is important because we are midway through the SDG goal agenda. And at the midway point, the world, instead of progressing, has actually regressed. And therefore, you need accelerated action of sustainable development goals so that we can make a difference to learning outcomes, health outcomes, nutrition, and to women. All this is important. There's also a huge priority on climate action and climate finance because the developed world, which had committed to Providing $100 billion a year in Copenhagen in 2009 has not lived up to its commitment. But irrespective of that, there are vast pools of resources available. Private and institutional resources, pension funds, which need to get into both climate finance and SDG into emerging markets and the global south. But they are not able to do this because there are no instruments of blended finance, credit enhancements, first loss guarantees, which multilateral institutions can provide so that you can de-risk projects in these emerging markets. And therefore, it's important that the multilateral institutions which were formed, the World Bank, IMF, and many other institutions which were formed in the post-World War II era, the post Bretton Woods period have outlived their utility and therefore they need to be redesigned for the world of today so that they can provide resources 
to change lives of citizens for, through SDGs and for climate action. And therefore, that is one of the key agendas of India. Climate action and climate finance is important because when we develop, it's important that most of the countries, it's important to understand that developing markets are not responsible for carbonizing the world. If you look at the 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050, the total carbon space available is 2,800 gigatons, out of which 2,400 gigatons has been occupied already, and 88% of that has been occupied by the developed world. India has only occupied 1.5% of the carbon space, whereas on a per capita income basis, it is entitled to 18.5% of this carbon space. But irrespective of that, the Prime Minister at Glasgow has committed to Panch Amrit, and that is that we'll accelerate the pace of sustainability through lifestyle for sustainability, and we'll become the first country in the world to industrialize without carbonizing the world. And therefore, for us, all this is important. And lastly, women-led development. The Prime Minister has focused on that because in India today, there are more women than men. There are 1,022 women as per the latest NFHS survey as compared to 1,000 men. And therefore, they have to be put in positions of leadership so that we can bring in greater financial and digital inclusion, provide more learning outcomes and improve the quality of lives for them and ensure that all women go to schools and have higher education and there's better nutritional standards so that we can produce a very healthy India of tomorrow. This is important because when we started the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, only 17% of the accounts were led by the women. Women in India owned only 17% of the account. The latest statistics show that almost 80% of the women in India have bank accounts. So the transformation has been from 17 to 80% and that has led to a huge amount of both digital and financial inclusion. So ladies and gentlemen, the priorities of India are, what I've said, is accelerated inclusive, resilient, sustainable growth, accelerating the pace of sustainable development goals, climate action and climate finance, including lifestyle for sustainability, that is life, doing digital transformation and digital public infrastructure, which is a huge narrative for India, because unlike the Western world and unlike the big tech model of USA, we've developed digital public infrastructure, which is open source, open API, interoperability, and we've built digital identity for 1.4 billion Indians. And between 2015 and 2017, we opened 480 million bank accounts. That is, during this period, 55% of the bank accounts opened across the world were opened in India. And every second bank account in the world was opened in India. And today we do, then we seeded Aadhaar and your mobile number with these bank accounts. 900 million Indians have mob smartphones and these were seeded into the bank accounts. And today we do 11x more payment, digital payments than what USA does, what USA and Europe do together and 4x of what China does. We've done about 2.2 billion COVID vaccine, COVID vaccination, all paperless, cashless, all digital. We provide health insurance to 500 million Indians, which is 500 million Indians means twice the population of the United States of America, all paperless. You can be moving from Tamil Nadu to Bihar, you can carry your digital health insurance across. We've also built in education, Diksha and Swam. So huge digital transformation of India is a remarkable story. The challenge is that, that in the world there are 4 billion people without a digital identity. There are 2.5 billion people without a bank account. There are 133 countries without a digital fast payment. And therefore the model of India needs to be taken across the world and this is the fastest way you can do digital transformation of the world. The Bank of International Settlement in its recent report has said that what India has achieved in the last eight years is equivalent to 50 years of progress. Eight years, what India has done in digitization is equivalent to 50 years of progress in transforming the lives of citizens in the world. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, what does a good successful presidency entail? First and foremost, the political narrative that we have an elected prime minister who's been elected uh, twice in a democracy and still has credibility of over 70% plus positive rate that in the world leader, in the mind of the leaders is a very big impact that you are in a democratic process, you have a very powerful leader in a democratic country. And second is the development narrative of what India has achieved in the last eight years. Last eight years, if you look at it, we built about 30 million houses, which is, which is like providing a house to every single Australian. Every single Australian. That's equivalent to the population of Australia. We provided about 110 million toilets, and that is like providing a toilet to every single German. That's equivalent to the population of Germany. And households, uh, water, we provided piped water to actually close to 243 million Indians, which is like providing water supply to every single citizen of Brazil. And we built over 55,000 kilometers of roads in the last five years, which is like providing one and a half times the diameter of the earth. We're building roads one and a half times the diameter of the earth. So what we've achieved in terms of development in the last, and Pradhan Mantri Jandan, Jan Arogya Yojana, 500 million health insurance. So what we've built in the last five years is a huge development narrative, which we need to tell the world that we've achieved in terms of digitization, in terms of the development story, and that is critical. The second important thing is what we, is the issue notes of India, the priorities that we've spelt out, which I talked about at length, and how we are able to shape the discussions across G20 countries and build them, bring them around to agree to that, and that will be the hard job of all the working groups, the finance track, and the engagement groups who are working with us. So G20, means 13 working groups on the Sherpa tracks, eight tracks on the finance side, and then there are engagement groups. All of us are working to see that India's priorities get achieved. And thirdly, how do we execute G20? Because unlike other G20s in the world, we are not doing G20 in one country, uh, in one city like Delhi. The Prime Minister was very clear, don't restricted to one city, so we have spread G20 to all the states of India. We are doing 215 events in 56 cities of India. For us, it's a Jan Andolan, it's about making G20 not an official meeting, but a people's movement. And therefore, we spread G20 right till the panchayat level and every school and citizens of India, so that people understand the significance and importance of what we are doing. We are also using the opportunity to transform the infrastructure, the roads, the drainage, the sewage, the solid waste in all these 56 cities of uh, India. We, when you go to Aurangabad, you go to Pune, you go to Hyderabad, you go to Kumaragam in Kerala, these are all transformed places because of G20. And secondly, we are using the states to push their culture. Each state is doing its own cultural program. We're using this opportunity to tell the states, push your culture, push your handicrafts, push your handloom. And everywhere, we are helping the states to build their own state brand entity and push it into the world. So if all the states of India use this opportunity to push their one district, one product, push their own culture, push their own handicrafts and handloom, this is a massive opportunity to transform India and make states into great brands. And we are also using this opportunity to move from water consuming crops to millet, which are full of iron, calcium, and protein. And every meal that we are serving has a millet component. Every gift that we are giving has a millet component. And therefore, what we are trying to do is that during the one year of India's presidency to use this opportunity to shape the destiny of the world and to shape it with an Indian narrative and an Indian narrative which is based on our culture, which is based on our transformational story of going digital, going green and for transforming India and which can then become the model for the rest of the world. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, sir. 
And with that, we come to the end of the second session and day one of this national convention on India's international relations. Okay. Can we have uh, anyone in interested in asking questions? Can raise their hands, please. <laughs> 